Hi, I'm Kane from Send3D and welcome to the video. Today I'm going to take you through step by step how to build your own ultra enclosure. This is the ultimate customizable enclosure for your 3D printers. It packs tons of features and functionality into an amazingly compact space. It uses standard low cost shelving for a sturdy frame. Foam insulation board helps keep the heat and fumes in. And these large acrylic doors give you easy access with a clear view inside. Plus, as a DIY kit, it's completely modular and customizable. This is a fairly conventional 2x3 layout, but the only real limit is your imagination. You could make your enclosure huge with multiple large format printers, or compact and small to fit in the corner of a room. You could use it to create a work surface, or get organized and add lots of storage space. The kit also comes with an ever-growing range of add-ons. Like this extractor fan so you can easily vent your prints and this temperature gauge mount for accurate chamber monitoring. The kit includes files for all of the printed parts as well as lifetime updates. So if I release a new add-on or update a part you can download and print it for free. With your ultra enclosure you'll be printing more reliably with less mess and less fumes in an amazingly compact space. You can buy the kit from ultraenclosure.com with that said, let's go back in time before this enclosure was built and get started. Before we can start building, we need to do a small amount of planning and also list out all the parts that will be needed. The first step is to measure the volume of space that your printers will need inside the enclosure. Now in my case, I'm going to use Ender 3s and I'm actually going to remove the spool holder from the top as it saves a considerable amount of height. Now most of my prints are not very tall, so I can actually mount my spool holder just here but alternatively you could mount it to the side of the printer or even outside the enclosure and feed the filament through a small hole. I can now start by measuring the height of the printer, which is 47 centimetres. I can also measure the maximum width, which is 45 centimetres. I'm going to extend the bed all the way to the back and measure the maximum depth that will be necessary in this case is 53 centimetres. Now obviously this will vary a lot from printer to printer but what we need to understand is the minimum height that we need for each shelf and we also want to ensure that the print bed doesn't collide with the door or the rear of the enclosure whilst it's printing. We're going to look at all of the parts required in the next section but we first need to select our shelving as this dictates the dimensions for everything else. Now the kit was designed and built with this excellent boltless shelving. It's strong, light, low cost and very easy to work with. However, this is a DIY kit and there are other shelving systems like this one here, which should work just as well. For this build, I've selected a unit that's 180 centimeters tall, 120 centimeters wide and 60 centimeters deep. If I draw this out and stack three printers on top of each other at 47 centimeters each, I still have 39 centimetres spare, which is plenty of room for the shelves and some spacing. Similarly, with two printers side by side, I need 90 centimetres and have 30 centimetres spare. So again, plenty of wiggle room. Finally, front to back, I need 53 centimetres and have 60, which is the tightest dimension, but should still work. Don't forget, I'm installing six identical printers here in a two by three configuration. However, you could set it up as two across and only two down, and you could also add a storage shelf. You could even adapt the width to have two larger printers and two smaller printers within the same enclosure. Now, if you find that you need more space in a particular direction, I have a few suggestions for you. Now, if your printer has a moving bed like the CR10 or the Ender 3, a very quick solution may be turning it sideways. It may not look quite as elegant, but it will give you a lot more flexibility in the maximum depth that you can hold. The other solution is what I call mix and match. For example, if you buy two 120 cm by 90 cm kits, then you can take the wider 120 cm pieces from both kits and use them to make a massive 120 by 120 cm unit. You could also take the extra upright pieces from the second kit to extend the height upwards as well. This is ideal for multiple large format printers. If you do go down this path, you'll also have to modify the shelving boards by cutting and adding an additional piece at the back, 
You'll also need to ensure that the new larger shelves are adequately supported across the middle. If you do need help or ideas, just drop me an email and I'll be happy to help. And if you want to see more ideas, just visit ultraenclosure.com. Now that we know the dimensions of our shelving unit and the configuration we're going to use, we can buy all of the other parts needed for this build. To make this as easy as possible, I'll be building a list of local retailers for each part you'll need, and I'll be adding to it regularly. You can access this list from the documentation page at ultraenclosure.com once you purchase the kit. First up is the insulation boards. Now this is light, low cost, easy to cut, and as you can imagine, it's really good at keeping the heat in. Now I'd recommend a thickness of 25 millimeters, but the kit does include files for thicker and thinner versions too. To calculate how much you'll need, let's look back at our shelving unit. I know it's 180 centimeters tall, and 120 centimetres wide. I also know the side is 180 centimetres tall and 60 centimetres deep. And there are two of these. This is the amount of insulation board we will need. Now if it's easier, you could cut these down further into thirds. But be careful to give yourself a bit of wiggle room. You don't want to find yourself short when you come to cutting the foam. I can get boards that are 120 centimetres by 240 centimetres. So with two of these, I know I'll have enough with plenty left over. The last major supply we'll need is acrylic. Now, you may know it as plexiglass, perspex or acrylite. They're all essentially brand names for the same clear plastic sheet. This acrylic will form the doors of the enclosure and I'd recommend a thickness of at least five millimeters. This will give you nice, strong, rigid doors. Any less and you might find that they start to droop and wobble during use. There are two main options here. You can either buy the sheet material and cut it down yourself, or there are some retailers that offer a custom cut service. If you go down the custom cut route, this could take slightly longer to arrive and maybe slightly more expensive, but also could be a good option if you're not very handy with tools. If you do go down this route, I'd encourage you to hold off ordering the acrylic until you've assembled your shelving unit. This allows you to measure the exact dimensions you need and will minimize the chance of any errors. I'm going to buy standard size squares and cut them down. Here in the UK, standard shed window sizes are 610 by 610, so I can buy this size much cheaper than any other dimension. To ensure a nice tight seal around the doors, I'll be using some of this self-adhesive foam tape. The approximate length I'll need is 4 times 180 for the two sides and the two centres. I'll also need 6 times 120 that gives me top and bottom coverage for each door. So for me, I'll need around 17 meters of tape, but I'm going to get around 20 just to be sure. Obviously, the amount you need will depend on the configuration you've chosen. Foil tape is an easy one if you don't have some already. This will be used primarily to cover the front edge of the insulation board, as well as fill any gaps within the enclosure once it's been built. Just make sure that it's wide enough to cover this front edge. I'd recommend 35 millimeters. Outside of the construction materials, I'll also be using a power strip, a reel of LED lights. These are RGB and powered off of a USB port. Six of these temperature sensors, a 60 millimeter 12 volt fan, a nine volt battery case, a length of this 50 millimeter ducting, and finally, if you choose to use the spring catches for the doors, you'll need some springs. I'd recommend an outer diameter of 10 millimeters and these are 40 millimeters in length. For all the fixtures and fittings, I'll be using M5 nuts and bolts. Within the kit, you'll find each part has its own folder with different options and variations. For example, auto close or regular hinges. You'll also find different sizes of each part to meet your specific needs. For this build, I've printed all of my parts in PETG for a combination of strength, resilience and ease. Within the kit files, you'll find a range of cutting and drilling templates. Make sure you print these at a scale of 100% and they'll make many of the tasks later on a lot easier. Finally, before we begin, I'm just going to summarize the tools that you'll need. I have a drill with a five millimeter bit, a 10 millimeter bit, and a countersink bit, an M5 hex key or Allen wrench. 
If you're cutting your own acrylic, you'll need a saw. In my case, I'm using a mini plunge saw. You could also use a jigsaw or another tool of your choice. A good quality sharp knife for cutting the foam, a mallet for the shelving, a marker pen, tape measure, and a long straight edge. Okay, so enough preparation, let's start building. The first thing we're going to do is assemble the bottom shelf and legs. Make sure both tabs lock into the uprights and gently tap them into place with your mallet. You can now insert the cross beams and add the board for the bottom shelf. Now add the connectors and remaining upright pieces to get the full height of the unit. Next I'm going to take the height measurement we worked out for each enclosure and measure up from the bottom shelf. In my case that's 60 centimeters. I'll add the frame for my second shelf here but not the board as we still need access to the space below. If you can, place a printer on the shelf to ensure it does actually fit. Before we start installing the foam, it's really helpful to mount a power strip on the back. This will ensure the cables for all of the printers are able to reach, even the ones at the top. I'm going to measure the distance between the two mounting holes on the power strip. I'm then going to mark this distance on the centre at the back of the shelving. Using my 5mm drill bit, I'm going to make two holes, one at either end. Once you're through, add a nut and bolt loosely to the two holes. Now I can install the power strip and tighten the nuts for a secure fit. For the foam, I'm going to measure the width and height at the back of the first shelf. I want the foam to go all the way into the corners and from the board up to the very underside of the shelf above. Cutting this foam is pretty straightforward. Measure and mark the rectangle and carefully cut along a straight edge. It should only take two or three passes to get a clean straight cut. Now take the foam and place it into the shelf at an angle. You should have a nice snug fit on the sides. As you push it up, it will hit the shelf braces in the middle. Mark the contact points like this. Now remove the foam again and cut notches for these shelf braces. Now, at the bottom of the backboard, I'm going to divide the width by 4. I'm going to mark this in from either end. I can now make a small notch to allow the power cables into the enclosure. We can now reinstall the foam. First, place the two power cables on the shelf for your printers and guide them through the gaps. Now just push the foam back up snugly into place. Next we need to measure the opening for the side panel. Once again, all the way into the corner and right up against the initial foam board. Double check the height, it should be the same as the backboard. Cut a piece of foam with these dimensions and fit it. Start at the back and slide the front edge into place. If you have a nice tight fit, you can cut two more identical pieces. Insert the second piece on the other side of the shelf. Finally, measure and mark the centre point of the shelf. Apply foil tape to the front edge of your last piece of foam and slide it into place, centred on the marks we just made. Slide a rear brace into position like this and pin it into place with 3D printed pins. Now add another rear brace to the top and again pin it into place. For the front, choose your relevant cutting template depending on whether you'd like to use the spring catch or twist catch. The spring catch requires more precise door dimensions and is less secure when only holding one door, but it does not add any additional holes to the door. If you're using the spring catch, it's really easy to assemble. Just take the pin, slide a spring over the top, pass it through the base and screw on the handle. The twist catch on the other hand allows independent doors to be opened and closed. It also enables your acrylic doors to be much closer together, however you will have to add two extra holes to each door. I'm going to add twist catches to this enclosure setup, so I'll take this template and line it up with the top. Now we just have to carefully notch out the gap. I can repeat this at the bottom too. 
Now both the top and bottom catches slide into place. I'll add pins to secure them both to the foam. Finally, ensure the board is perfectly centered and screw two self-tapping screws into the bottom bracket. If you prefer, you could also glue the bracket down instead. We'll secure the top bracket a little later. Now if you want to install LEDs, this is an ideal time to do it. Measure out the width of the shelf and cut the LED tape at a marked point. Cut from the end closest to the power cable. We can now take some wire of an appropriate gauge and solder it onto the pads at the other end. Leave plenty of extra to extend and connect it to the next strip a little later. You can now peel and stick the LED tape to the underside of the shelf. It's also a good idea to insulate any metal the LEDs may touch. This will avoid any shorts that could prevent the LEDs from working. Just add some electrical tape at these points. Flip the board over and drop it into place. We're now ready to move to the next level. Repeat the whole process all over again. Measure the shelf height and install the bars. Measure and cut the foam. Mark and cut the notches. Measure and cut the side panels. Fold tape and install the center panel. Add and pin the braces. Notch the openings and install the braces. However, this time when you screw down the bottom brace, ensure the screws tap into the top brace from the shelf below. Measure and cut the LED strips. This time run the remaining cable from the first shelf up to the LED strip. Solder more cable onto the other end to create a continuous circuit. Tape the cables and LED down and install the board. Repeat it all one final time. And you're done. We now have the basic structure for our ultra enclosure. The next step is to install the hinges. To select the correct size of hinge, I'm going to measure the gap between the openings. I'll take this measurement and select the hinges with the same or similar screw gap. This ensures the screws will be secured evenly between the gaps. In most cases, two hinges should be plenty for a door with one at the top and one at the bottom. Place the hinge against the side of the frame and ensure it overhangs by the thickness of your acrylic. Ideally, if you can, use a piece of acrylic pressed up against the shelves to check you have it positioned just right. Use a pen to carefully mark the three bolt holes through the hinges. Now push the foam board out of the way and carefully drill the three holes we just marked. If you're using this style of boltless shelving, you should be able to use the existing holes. I'd recommend adding some penny washers to ensure the screws will be properly secured. Press three nuts into the hinge and offer it up to the shelving again. Carefully screw the hinge into place from the inside. Once you have it right, repeat this step for all of the other hinges. Now it's time to cut the doors to size. Let's start at the bottom. Place some spacers on the floor and the acrylic on top of that. This will ensure an even clearance gap. You can print these spacers out from the kit and use a height of your choice. Push the acrylic up against the hinges. Now mark the required height and width you need. Mark at least two points for each cut line to ensure it will be straight. For the top, you need to ensure there will be enough overlap for your foam tape, but also enough space for the door above. When it comes to width, again we need to ensure there's enough overlap for a sill, but not too much that the other door cannot close. If you're using the spring catch, we also need to make sure we don't clash with the handle in the middle. I'm also going to label the door. This means I'll know which side is the front and where the top is. Now I have my lines, I'm going to cut the acrylic. I'm using this mini plunge saw. I can set it to the appropriate depth and get a pretty nice straight line. There are also plenty of guides online for alternative methods to cut acrylic sheets. As you can see, it fits the gap great. 
Before I cut the next door, I'm actually going to fit this one and check everything lines up as I expected. To do this, I need to put the acrylic back on the spacers tight against the hinges. With everything held tight in place, I can use a pen to mark the six holes I need. Now take the acrylic out and start drilling the holes. I'm using a 5mm drill bit and drilling from the front to the back. I'm applying a very light amount of pressure as I drill. This reduces the chance of chipping or shattering as it breaks through. Now all six holes are drilled, I can flip the panel over and use my countersink bit to create a recess for each hole. Now let's remove the plastic from around the hinge areas. If you haven't already, insert the M5 nuts into the hinges. One by one, I can now screw them down and tighten. As you can see, it works great and the unit is really starting to come together. For the other door, I'll just repeat the same process. And for the next door, the only difference is that I'll rest the spacers very carefully on the door below to give me a neat uniform gap all the way along. And four more pieces of acrylic later, I have all six doors cut and hung on the enclosure. If you've chosen to buy your acrylic custom cut, the process is very similar. The only difference is that you have to measure all six openings at once and we need to account for the gaps without using spacers. You're on the home straight now, I'm going to add the handles next. Print out the drilling template file and make sure it's at 100% scale. Start by measuring the centre point of the door. Depending how far in you want the handle, cut the template at the desired line. Now it's just a matter of lining it up with the centre and marking the two drill holes. I'll drill them out once again with my 5mm drill bit from the front and again countersink from the back. I can now push two captured nuts into the handle, pull the plastic away from the door and screw them into place. Five more times and all of your doors now have handles. If you've gone with spring catches, your doors are now done. They should open with ease and latch closed nicely. I'm using twist catches, so I've one further step. I printed out the twist catch template and cut along the dotted line. I can now line it up with the catch and mark my exact drill point. I'll mark both the top and the bottom. Just like before, I can now remove the door and this time I'll be using a 10mm drill bit to carefully drill the two holes. We can add the two halves of the screw catch, making sure the handle is on the front. Get it nice and tight but still possible to twist. If you find it does unscrew itself during use, you can also use a dab of glue inside the thread. And with the door back on, everything looks and works great. Repeat the steps five more times and the catches are all now in place. The final step we need to take is installing the foam tape around the door opening. This will ensure a nice tight seal when the doors are closed. First, I'm going to roll out the horizontal lengths for the shelves. Once these are in place, I'll add the vertical strips on the edges and finally down the centre. What you're looking for is the best possible seal when the doors are closed. These enclosures are well insulated but not completely airtight, so don't worry if there are minor gaps you cannot avoid. This is also a good time to check the inside of the chambers. And if there are any significant gaps, you can use the foil tape to seal them up. Now we have the base unit set up, you can finish here and you'll have a great ultra enclosure. However, I'm going to add a few extras onto my setup. I also plan to use the enclosures on the left side for printing ABS, so I want to include venting fans. The idea is that if the enclosure has been printing ABS for 24 hours or so, I don't want to then open the door and take a nice deep breath of that air. First, I'm going to take the extractor fan template and cut it out. Just place it where you'd like the vent inside the enclosure and mark it with a pen. Now we can carefully cut it out with a knife. The base of the fan unit can be pushed through the hole 
and is secured with a large screw cap on the other side. The extractor fan itself is a 12 volt fan that I connected up to a 9 volt battery pack. It's a little underpowered but should do the job just fine. I'll screw it securely into the housing and then secure the duct onto the other end. Now when I'm printing I have this slat in place. When the print is finished I'll drop the hose out the window, slide the fan into place, remove the slat and turn on the power. It won't take long to vent but we'll look at this in more detail shortly. The advantage of this design is you can have multiple vent holes but only need one fan set up. You can easily slide it in and out of different enclosures as you need it. The final add-on I'm going to install is these temperature gauges. They'll give me a clear and simple way to see the ambient temperature inside the chambers. I'm going to clip the gauges into place like this. Now I can slide out the foam, notch out a small gap and slide the gauge into place. And we're done. Six awesome 3D printer chambers, lit, monitored, insulated and super easy to use. It's like a mini factory in a compact space. To help demonstrate the advantage of the Ultra Enclosure, I'm going to finish this video with some demonstrations and tests. However, if I'm going to test it, I need some printers. And it just so happens I have six Ender 3s waiting to be assembled. I'm now going to run a couple of demonstrations, looking at the insulation and the containment of the Ultra Enclosure setup. First off, let's see the difference the insulation makes. I've designed a custom ABS torture test, and yes, you can download it free from the link in the description below. It's a tall model that I print at 80% infill with lots of sharp 90 degree angles. This will really emphasize the challenges of ABS and its notorious warping and shrinking. Both printers are set up identically and are printed in the same room at the same time. I've used a PEI bed with ABS juice for maximum adhesion. The G-code file is also identical. The only difference is one is inside the Ultra Enclosure and the other is outside. As you can see, the difference between the two models couldn't be more stark. Outside the enclosure, every corner has cracked and warped. There's barely a feature that's printed successfully. By comparison, inside the enclosure, the print is almost perfect. And with a bill plate temperature of 100 degrees, the ambient temperature inside the enclosure maintained 50 degrees throughout which is excellent without any dedicated heater inside the chamber. The second major advantage of using an enclosure is that it generally reduces the smells and gases that get pumped into the room. As a side point, whilst this enclosure may help, it is in no way guaranteed to contain any or all dangerous gases. You should always 3D print in a well-ventilated room and seek further professional guidance on best practice for healthy and safe 3D printing. With that said, for my test, I'm going to use a smoke machine to visualize the spread of gas and its movement. First off, I place the smoke machine inside a chamber with the door removed. For each test, I'll activate the machine for 15 seconds to create an equal volume of smoke. As I hope you can see in the footage, it very quickly fills the entire room. And what may be hard to pick up on camera is the haze that was in the air for a significant amount of time after the test. For the second test, I'm going to return the door and close it. As you can see, the same 15 second burst looks radically different. Almost all of the smoke is contained within the chamber, and even after 10 minutes, the smoke is almost entirely contained within. However, as you can imagine, and we'll see here, this creates a new problem. If you store up all of the gases from a long print and then stick your head inside, you're hardly improving the situation. So for the final test, I'm going to attach and turn on the extractor fan, drop the hose out of the window, and trigger the same 15 second burst. As you can see here side by side, with the fan on the smoke has almost entirely gone within 5 minutes. Meanwhile without the fan, after more than 10 minutes, there is clearly still smoke inside the chamber. Based on these results, you could run your print with the enclosure sealed up, and once it's complete, attach the fan for 5 to 10 minutes. 
before opening it for the best results. If you've made it this far, thank you so much. Your support, input, comments, likes and subscribes all mean so much to me. You can of course find out more and buy the files for this project by visiting ultraenclosure.com. I want to keep improving this kit with more options, updates and add-ons. So let me know in the comments what you think I can do to make the Ultra Enclosure Kit even better. It could be an integrated spool holder, maybe somewhere to store your tools, different handles, or even somewhere to mount a Raspberry Pi. Let me know what you'd like to see most. Finally, if you get stuck during your build, need some help, or have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to email me. I'll be more than happy to help. Thanks again for watching and happy printing.